Welcome to One Mic. I'm your host, Country Boy. Today's episode is about Black Eden. Black Eden was the town of Ottawa, which is an incorporated community in Michigan that became a thriving black resort community in the early 20th century. Please hit the subscribe button. But without further ado, let's get started. During the early 20th century, vacationing became firmly entrenched in American culture. Traveling recreationally became more popular for people of all races, gender, and social class. The expansion of the U.S. rail system, as well as mass production of the automobile and the development of the national highway system dramatically changed vacationing. Vacationers now were able to travel seamlessly throughout the lower 48 states and along with technological advancement, increasing number of Americans with vacation time and a desire to exercise their newfound freedom and independence. During this time, separate black institutions grew out of this concept of the new Negro that existed in Black America during the post-Reconstruction era. African Americans brought different strategies of the struggle of the new Negro's fight against racism and discrimination. Black newspapers like the Chicago Defender serve a dual function of reporting the news and stimulating racial solidarity. And Black resorts and other separate Black institutions serve ideal geographic locations for promoting racial solidarity. And through this ideology, a growing number of black resorts for black vacationers became a prime battleground for promoting racial upliftment and physical rejuvenation through a peaceful, safe vacation. Idaho was founded in 1912, and at the time, it was only the third resort in America that catered to black visitors. During this period, a small but very distinguished African-American middle class, largely composed of professionals and small business owners from Northern Northern centers. Despite a market for black tourism and the financial means for leisure travel, segregation was in full effect, and it prevented them from visiting resort destinations and safe recreational options for black families were extremely limited. Idaho was located 30 miles east of the larger resort town of Ludington. Tucked away in the woods of a national forest, the resort was a reasonable driving distance from places like Chicago, St. Louis, or Detroit, yet invisible enough so that African Americans could retreat from the ugliness of discrimination and Jim Crow. It was a resort like none other in the United States. It is where black people could come and not have to worry about not being served and not being allowed to use the hotel or the motel or the facilities. Idaho was founded by a group of white developers who saw the opportunity to capitalize on this growing black middle class and their disposable income. Four white land developers and their wives organized the Idaho Resort Company, IRC, and secured the land rights. And IRC built a cabin, homesteaded the land for three years, and eventually obtained the title of the land through the Branch Anderson Tyrell Real Estate Company. And the land became the central focus of this resort community. Once the IRC owned this land, the company immediately began recruiting African American middle class salespeople to market the lots as well as employing the services of black professionals like Charles Anderson who successfully marketed the resort through word of mouth. The black press was also critically important to the success of black institutions like Ottawa. The IRC initiated an advertising campaign in Negro newspapers like the Chicago Defender, the Indianapolis Recorder, or the Pittsburgh Courier. These ads in these major news outlets offered lots for $6 down and only $1 a month, citing hunting, fishing, boating, horseback riding opportunities. And the ad was extremely successful because it took advantage of a purchasing habit in the black community which involves spending small amounts of money over a long period of time on extremely important things. For example, African Americans would join burial societies where they were expected to pay a few pennies per week toward their future funeral expenses. The IRC 
also organized excursions to attract middle-class African-Americans from Detroit, Chicago, and other Midwestern cities, taking them on tours of the rustic communities and selling lots, a 1919 pamphlet used by the IRC to promote the community entitled Beautiful Idlewild. It describes it as a hunter's paradise, renowned for its beautiful lakes, its pure spring water, its myriad of game fish, and promoters in the area emphasize the lack of prejudice and the freedom of movement for blacks without being ostracized or hatred. It remarked that it was a town where they could truly feel like American citizens. One of the most prominent members in early Ottawa was Dr. Daniel Hale Williams, most influential African-American in the field of medicine at the time. In 1893, he was the first surgeon in the United States to perform open heart surgery. Williams and 20 others were among the first group of African-American professionals to join the IRC's excursion to Ottawa. He bought his first property in Ottawa in 1915 and Williams' presence was highly visible and he had a tremendous impact on the development of Idlewild. Sometime in 1920, Williams built a small luxurious bungalow that overlooked the Idlewild Lake and furnished it with electricity and the bungalow also had a chicken coop and a rose garden and Williams would later retire to Idlewild and become a major landowner and a leader within the community. He co-founded the Idlewild Improvement Association which acquired property from the white developers and would later sell that property to prominent black African Americans, which included W.E.B. Du Bois and Madam C.J. Walker. As president of the IIA, he built a small hotel, which he entitled Oakmere, accompanied by a small park. And he later constructed a summer pavilion near the park where he and guests could sit and watch the sunset. The development of Ottawa, through not necessarily a part of the Harlem Renaissance, was heavily influenced by new Negro personalities. The appeal of racial pride was another reason for the early success in Ottawa. During the early 20s, racial pride was in high demand as evident of the New Negro Movement, the Harlem Renaissance, and Garveyism. And these personalities encouraged W.E.B. Du Bois, while he was serving as editor of The Crisis, to ask his readers to write in about successful vacations at these summer resorts that were emerging for colored folk. Du Bois published an essay from H. H. DeWitt in the crisis where he made the observations about Ottawa like two playful children, my wife and I roamed the cultivated fields, rambled through the woods, drank turpentine water that collected in boxes on pine trees, picked blackberries, and this essay sparked the desire for Du Bois to visit Idlewild himself. In 1921, he published his own essay in the crisis about Idlewild. Du Bois not only explained how Idlewild was founded and developed, but he wanted to help Idlewild get put on a national spotlight. Although Du Bois was initially suspicious of the motivations of the white men running the IRC, Idlewild impressed him so much that while staying, he began to see the cultural space as more than a mere hidden treasure. Du Bois' observations about Idlewild as a living historical space influenced him to purchase several lots, and although he never developed those lots, Du Bois did offer his blessing and encouraged African Americans to invest in Idlewild. And this free advertising and gracious compliment from such a notable figure helped boost interest from African American professionals who were also subscribers to the crisis magazine. In 1923, the Pierre Marquette Railroad was built a branch line in the area. It was called the Resort Special, with sleeping cars from Chicago and Detroit via Grand Rapids and would run from June to September. The Pierre Marquette Railroad ran trains from Ottawa Station to Baldwin and the other resort town in Ludington. The railroad helped entice a wide variety of members of the other black middle class to come to Ottawa for entertainment and recreation, even though it was far removed from urban centers where they resided and worked. 
By 1924, the IIA had gained partial control of the island along with the ownership of the clubhouse and many of the lakefront properties surrounding Ottawa Lake. As the IRC expanded and developed to other subsites, the IIA represented the black residents in the area. The same year, the IIA published, distributed its own brochure claiming that if Atlanta City was America's playground, Ottawa was the Negro's playground. The IIA promoted the resort by designated Ironwild the Atlantic City of the West and stating that if you've ever visited the Wonderland in Michigan that you would wholeheartedly agree with this statement. The IRC understood that to attract these and many other black professionals to the area they had to convince them that Ottawa was the place to be and they could come and enjoy the pleasures of outdoor recreation and also provide them with the best in entertainment. This aspect of the IRC's experiment proved to be quite a success for the commercialization of outdoor leisure and recreation. Ottawa was constantly being shaped into a recreational space and the company fully embraced accommodation and integration as their political philosophy. In 1925, the IRC catered their politics to that of wealthy and famous African-American consumers by bringing Chautauqua to gather together the cream of the crop of colored talent in the entire country. The Chautauqua was an adult entertainment and social movement in the United States in the late 19th, early 20th century, which brought entertainment and culture to small towns in and around America. Between 1915 and 1927, the annual African-American visitors in Ottawa increased from just a few hundred to five or six thousand. This historical movement was ripe for an opportunity for middle and upper class African-American migrants to leave the imprint on the Ottawa community. And as a result of the growing black population, especially during the summer months, the money that was being introduced in the area black black resorters allowed Ottawa to boost its business district in record time. In the business district, black resorters could find a dress shop, a grocery stores, car wash, bike rental shop, at least five cafes, two hotels, 12 motels, a boarding house, four nightclubs, and even a post office. And a great majority of these businesses were black owned. The number of visitors and year-round residents and developments just kept growing and growing and growing in Idaho, and even the Great Depression couldn't slow this down. This was largely thanks to the publicity the community had received through the black press, as well as the support of local and state and federal policies, as well as the initiatives of black communities in the Southwest, and it allowed Idaho to continue to grow despite the Great Depression. During the height of the enforcement of segregation and Jim Crow laws, Ottawa was a haven from racial strife, and the Ottawa Chamber of Commerce was even noted in the famous Negro Green Book in 1946. The Negro Green Book was the official guide to hotels, tourist homes, restaurants, and other places where Negroes were welcome without issue. Young musicians always served a period of apprenticeship in which they were able to play juke joints and back alley bars where they were allowed to improve their techniques, explain their repertoire, and boost their audience. Despite making the rounds in bars and large urban centers, the talents of all types found their way to Ottawa, where they contribute enormously to the growth and development of Ottawa as a resort community. At one time or another, most notable intellectual, musical, and artistic talents were nurtured within Ottawa, bringing the community close in harmony with the ideals of the New Negro and the Renaissance movement in black communities such as New York or Chicago. As Ottawa gained national stature among African Americans during the period between World War I and World War II, the Ottawa Land Owners Association had members in almost 34 states. In addition to clubs and bars, the island provided summer entertainment for tourists and employment opportunities for seasonal and year-round residents in the community. Following World War II, Ottawa started to attract the attention of working middle-class African Americans. 
With the construction of more paved roads within Idlewild and greater availability of electricity, a new generation of entrepreneurs began to invest in Idlewild. African-American businessmen took advantage of the market by purchasing property within Idlewild and developing these areas to an elaborate night spot and business center. This new generation of black businesses offered amenities associated with other high-end resorts and black entertainment offerings. Idlewild justified legit comparisons with urban landmarks like Harlem Savoy Ballroom or the Apollo Theater. Between 1930 and 1960, African-American performers such as Count Basie, Duke Ellington, Della Reese, Sarah Vaughn, James Brown, The Four Tops, Aretha Franklin, B.B. King, all had Idlewild on their tour circuit. Word of mouth of these performances made Idlewild a must for anyone who had never been to the area. Idlewild became a showcase for the talents of both well-known and lesser-known entertainers. And many of these lesser-known artists went on to become nationally and internationally known. Two of Idlewild's larger venues, the Flamingo Room and the Paradise Club, offered two shows nightly and staggered hours so patrons could go from one club to the other. The arrangement emulated to avoid ballrooms, two bandstand models, Model with a pristine beach in the middle for good measure. Parties and after parties in Idlewild became the stuff of legend. The performances entertained both black Idlewilders and white citizens who traveled in from the Lake County Township through the 1950s and early 60s. One resident will recall that on some nights there were more white people than blacks and it wasn't about race, it was about having a good time. The Fiesta Room at the Paradise Club would feature singers, dancers and showgirls and entertainers from May to September and starting in 1950, turned Ottawa into the Summer Apollo of Michigan. The Paradise Club will feature showgirls and chorus girls, both with guest entertainers, and they will perform not only in Ottawa, but they will take the show on the road during the off season in the Arthur Briggs Ottawa Review. They would appear in cities like Toronto, Boston, Kansas City, and Chicago, as well as New York at the Apollo Theater. This helped showcase Ottawa as a major talent center, as well as contributing to the financial prosperity within the area. By the 1950s and early 60s, Ottawa it reached the height of its popularity. During those years, 25,000 vacationers made their way to the community, temporarily overwhelming the permanent residents in the area. During this era, Ottawa boasted more than 300 Black-owned businesses. In a 2017 interview, John Meeks recalled Ottawa stating that in its high point between the early 40s and early 60s, 30,000 folks would descend on here in the summer and hundreds of black owned businesses thrived. This place was hopping. We had a roller rink for the kids. We had our own fire department and even a post office. While Ottawa provided safety, relaxation, and a community for black African Americans during this high point, it rose out of necessity due to racist federal and local policies. And it was precisely because America had established a caste system that a small group of white men were able to purchase large parcels of land in Michigan, develop it, vigorously market it as the best place for colors in this country. And that same group had no misgivings whatsoever about establishing another resort for whites, which it was generally understood that even the black maids and chauffeurs were not welcome overnight. Racial segregation and discrimination was a double-edged sword. It contributed to the emergence of the caste system in this country and the system allowed for social order between the whites and the blacks. This caste system made it a necessity for the black community to have its own social institutions. The civil rights movement began in the 1950s, began to constantly challenge that caste system, specifically legislation that upheld segregation and denied African-American equal accommodations. Social integration was proclaimed by many civil rights leaders and politicians as the true American dream. A majority of the focus of the civil rights movement integrating these groups into a harmonious social mass. Many African Americans readily embraced both enabling legislation for the end of segregation and challenging this legislation by going into white establishments. 
Following the enactment of the Civil Rights Act of 1964, and specifically the Public Accommodations Act of 1964, businesses in Idlewild declined. Other vacation resorts began to accommodate African American visitors with the federal law requiring that they had to be accepted everywhere. African Americans began to take advantage of this opportunity, and the vision of a self-sufficient black community was not enough to overcome the powerful attraction of thousands upon thousands of stores and hotels and restaurants where they had formerly been prohibited. But in return, whites, however, did not come across those economic borders and spend their money at black establishments. Just as integration of organized baseball essentially eliminated the Negro League, integration also had negative consequences for other sectors of the black community. Segregation is what built out a while and the Civil Rights Act of 1964 turned out to be the community's undoing. During the late 60s, a new breed of younger blacks began to learn about the history and significance of Idlewild. Black nationalism resonated wildly among the new element, among these new blacks, which did not want to see the resort of Idlewild die. Realizing that Idlewild had not been prepared to meet the integration challenge, the Idlewild Landowners Association held an annual convention to address the possibility of a possible renaissance of the resort, but it seemed that those to couldn't afford to invest in the resort so it could continue to attract black vacationers just weren't that interested. And some viewed the decline in popularity as an admission that Ottawa was not up to physical challenge presented to them by the civil rights legislation. By the early 70s, the National Recession ended any ideas of a renaissance and further contributed to the economic downturn in Ottawa and led to a population decline as the local employment options dwindled. Ottawa became a lesser known family vacation spot and retirement community. By 1998, the economy was in a dismal state and Ottawa was mostly a ghost town. Whole blocks were completely deserted and vacant except for the crumbling shacks that were once homes. The Paradise Club had been torn down and the Flamingo Club had been closed down. In 2003, Ottawa Historic Cultural Center opened, creating a destination for visitors to learn about the community's history. And blight removal efforts successfully cleaned up many of the dilapidated buildings in this area. In 2013, the state of Michigan invested $500 million in funds for a 10-year strategic plan for Ottawa completed as a tourism development for Ottawa, Michigan. Today, the Ottawa Historical Center is open on Saturdays and offers guided tours of the community as well as stops to the remains of the Camingo Club and the Paradise Club, as well as prestigious homes of prominent individuals. National Idlewilders Clubs continues to hold annual events to promote the community and remember its history. Black Eden was a resort where black writers, businesses, physicians, entertainers spent their summers during the era of Jim Crow segregation. And even before the Green Book, Ottawa catered to black vacationers by creating a prosperous community that thrived despite Jim Crow segregation. It was a place that was created because of segregation and ultimately segregation was its undoing. Thank you. I'm Country Boy. This has been One Mike, and this has been the story of Black Eden. If you like this, you can find more stories like this at OneMikeHistory.com. Also, please hit the subscribe button. Please give us five stars on Apple Podcasts. And if you'd like to support the podcast, you can do so by subscribing to my Patreon or my Buy Me Coffee. And peace.